Hey, it's Jason from Skinny Research and Development, and this is an A-stable multivibrator. Now, we've talked about A-stable multivibrators before. Usually, we talked about them in the context of a triple five timer, but in this circuit, there is no triple five timer. Uh, there is no IC. There is no oscillator whatsoever. It's just a resistor, some capacitors, and a couple of transistors. Now, in the past, we've talked about an A-stable multivibrator and what that means. And what it is is it's a circuit that doesn't really hold a state. It always flips the output from positive to negative or up or down or high to low. And we can usually determine how long that state stays on or stays off. So if you look up a stable multivibrator on the internet, you will see some version of this particular circuit. And it's kind of interesting. I've heard it once said that uh, it looks like it shouldn't work at all, uh, but because things aren't exactly perfect in the real world, it, it does work. Uh, but we'll get into that and talk about that. So let's take a look at the circuit. So to start with, this circuit's gonna receive power at four points. And as usual, I'm using a nine volt battery. In this case, I think a, a weak nine volt battery. Off of these four points, there'll be four resistors. Next, you'll have two capacitors. Next, just for effect, I'm gonna have two LEDs just so you can see how the circuit's working, although these aren't necessary for the circuit to actually work itself. Next, we have our two transistors, and these are NPN transistors. These two transistors are gonna to connect to ground out of their emitters, and now we connect everything else together. So let's take a look at what's going on here. We've got these four resistors and they're connected to voltage. So as soon as you turn this circuit on, uh, that voltage is going to, of course, try to flow to ground. Uh, now this leg over here is gonna have a bit of a problem with that because um, this transistor isn't turned on quite yet and nor is this one. And so what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a race uh, between the current that's flowing through R2 and R3. And what that race is, is gonna be the first uh, one of these legs that's gonna turn their transistor on. And we're gonna think about these transistors as a switch. As soon as the voltage here on the base gets up to usually around 0.7 volts, in our case with this transistor, it's uh, 0.95 volts, uh, it's gonna turn this leg on and allow current to flow to ground. So as soon as you turn the switch on, uh, these two are in competition. The winner of that competition is usually going to be the resistor uh, that is less in value uh, coupled with uh, the capacitance uh, that is less in value. Now even if you have R2 and R3 and C1 and C2 all at the same value, um, it doesn't really matter because physically in the real world all four of these components cannot be perfect matches of each other. So as current is starting to flow through R2 and R3 and the voltage is beginning to build up on the base, whichever one of these achieves that threshold voltage uh, first is going to be the winner and is gonna start this circuit off. Incidentally, this is why some people who kind of teach this will say that maybe this circuit shouldn't theoretically work because if all of these components were matched, and current was all flowing down at the same time, and both of these turned on at exactly the same time, then the effect that you see wouldn't really start. So let's just say that we know it's an imperfect world and that one of these two transistors turns on and this whole process begins. So let's start with the process where uh, this transistor kind of wins the day and we'll skip through a couple of cycles because there's some interesting stuff that happens at the very beginning, but let's go ahead and go to a, a state where this is pretty repetitive. So voltage comes down here and turns this transistor on. When this just transistor turns on, current's gonna flow from this nine volt source here through R4. It's going to turn on this LED and flow to ground. At the very same time though, right before this transistor uh, switches, uh, this capacitor has been kind of charging up uh, from this nine volts here. Uh, and as soon as this transistor turns on, uh, something interesting kind of happens with this capacitor. On this side of the capacitor, you had before this thing went to ground, you had a voltage of 0.95 volts. So 0.95 volts on this side, charging up to around nine volts on this side. So, so there's about eight volts across this capacitor. As soon as this goes to ground, what happens is you change the reference point for this capacitor. So where this, there was nine volts over here and 0.95 over here, now you've given this a ground and you're gonna end up with a negative voltage on this side. So what happens is that this transistor all of a sudden is going from seeing a voltage of 0.95 volts to seeing a voltage of negative eight volts.
or somewhere around in that region. Because of that, this transistor immediately shuts off. So now that this transistor is shut off, some interesting things start to occur. The first interesting thing is that this point is now at negative eight volts. So it begins to charge up again. So now we have to charge from a negative voltage back to a positive voltage for this transistor to turn on. And that threshold voltage, like we said, is somewhere around 0.95 volts. So while this is referenced to ground, R3 begins to charge up this side of the capacitor to get to that 0.95 volts. At the same time, current is flowing through, through R1 and charging up the plate of C1 over here, and it's charging this side up to 9 volts as it had over here before. Now, as this charging is taking place, this LED stays on the entire time. And eventually, what will happen is this capacitor will charge all the way up to 0.95 volts. After that occurs, this transistor will turn on and we're gonna have a repeat of what happened on this side. Current will begin to flow. This capacitor C1 will now have a different reference point because it's gonna be connected to ground. So this side over here uh, now becomes negative eight volts for the same reason it did over here. This negative eight volts then turns this transistor off, which turns this LED off. So now this LED is on and this LED is off. As one transistor turns on, the other transistor will be locked off. And as one side of a capacitor is charging on one side, the inside plate is charging up on the other. Now we can use this circuit for something other than just lighting LEDs. We could actually put some outputs here and here. We could call this output Q and we could call this output Q0. And the reason we would label them this way is because what you'll notice is that every time this LED is on or every time there's current flowing uh, through this side, then this side of the circuit is at a high. And at the very same time, since there's current flowing in this leg, that means there is not current flowing on this leg. So we know that this side is gonna be a low. So you have two different outputs, and at any given time, these two outputs are the opposite of each other. So if we wanna take the output of this, and run it to another transistor so that it turns on an enunciator or another LED or just bring something to ground so that you can power whatever you want, uh, this circuit will accomplish that for you. And it'll accomplish that in that multi-vibrator A-stable state where we have an on and an off and an on and an off, and just like the triple five timer did for us. Now there is some math uh, that's involved in this so that if you wanna kind of guess what values of uh, R2 or R3 or C1 or C2 that you want, uh, you can mess around with them to determine how long something turns on or how long something turns off. Uh, the period as far as uh, how long it takes from uh, the rise uh, of the output to the next rise of the output uh, can be determined by this formula. So you have a period equals uh, T1 plus T2, where T1 is equal to 0 0.69 times C1 times R2, and T2 equals 0 0.69 times C2 times R3. So by varying the values of C1, R2, and C2, R3, uh, we can determine how long uh, this waveform is on and off, whether you're using Q0 or Q. Taking a look at the actual circuit, uh, it's really quite easy to build. It's just uh, two circuits that are kind of the mirror image of each other. In this particular one, I've got R1 and R4 as being one kilo ohm resistors. I have the R2 and R3, the timing resistors. Uh, these are at 220K. And then I have a small capacitor uh, here, two small capacitors. They're both at uh, 10 microfarad. The transistors that I'm using are 2N3904. And the reason I knew to put them in the orientation that I have them is that uh, according to the data sheet, we're looking at the flat side of the transistor. The emitter is on the, uh, on the left side. And so I have these transistors uh, oriented such uh, that the emitter is going to ground here. Uh, these two green wires are both going to ground. And then the blue wires here are just carrying voltage from the LED into the collector of the transistor. The only thing that uh, is just a little funny is these two orange wires that are crossing. The bottom side of this capacitor has the orange wire coming off of it and feeding into the base over here. And similarly on this side, uh, the bottom of this capacitor is feeding this wire to the base of this transistor over here. So all you really need to do is build 
this half of the circuit on this side, copy it on this side, and then crisscross these two uh, wires in the end. And once you plug it up, you'll notice that right away the circuit starts up. Let's take a look at this on the oscope. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put both of these probes at the point where we would normally have the output, so on Q and Q naught, uh, where I had it shown earlier. And we'll take a look and see what the output of this looks like. I'll have to uh, switch you over here to the oscilloscope. So on one of these, Q, we see that we've got a rising edge here and we have this nice count. And also over here, we see exactly the opposite, right? So like we talked about Q and Q naught, Q naught is, needs to be exactly the opposite of what's happening at Q. And so these are the nice two uh, waveforms we're getting. You can see some of the characteristics down here at the bottom. Frequency is really slow, quite slowly. If you do the math, you'll see that this should be somewhere around 350 millihertz. Um, but like I said, components aren't perfect, so you end up with slightly different than what you calculate. Another interesting thing to see is what happens at the capacitors. So this is what's happening on those capacitors on the back side of it, where I said that the voltage goes negative. So uh, if you look, you can see here that uh, on the one, it's just above that one volt range before it falls down to, you know, down here to, to a, a extreme negative number. In this case, it's, you know, almost negative five volts that it's falling down to and then gradually charges back up. And you can see down here, it's complement the other capacitor on the other side and what's happening there. As this is being maintained at a steady state around one volt, uh, the other side is actually charging up, getting to that point. And as, as soon as it gets up to that point nine, five volts or one volt uh, threshold, uh, then the other capacitor goes low to negative five volts and begins to charge back up from there. Now you might be thinking, well, you told us earlier that this should be a negative eight volts. Well, a couple of things are going on here. One, I have a battery that is nearly dead. So the voltage is a lot lower than it's supposed to be somewhere around seven or, or just below seven volts. So my battery is, is fairly weak right now. So you know, you're not seeing as much of a voltage swing there. This negative drop was probably the most fascinating thing uh, to me about this circuit. So I've seen this circuit a lot, but I never realized that the voltage dropped so dramatically on the base of that transistor when that flip occurred. And so what I did is I took and I, I made um, just a portion of the circuit to prove to myself that this was actually happening. And so I'll show that to you now. So what I have here is a fairly large capacitor, uh, a 1K resistor, a 1K resistor, uh, this 1K resistor is connecting power to this side of the capacitor. I have a 220K resistor connecting power uh, to this side of the capacitor. And then over here uh, that is now lifted and not connected to ground at the moment is a wire that goes from this side of the capacitor to ground, but it's floating at the moment. And then I have a resistor on this side that's going from the capacitor uh, to ground, and it's currently connected. So I also have my oscope over, and what I'm gonna do is I am going to pull ground from this resistor, but at the same time, I'm going to connect the ground to the opposite side, and you'll see what happens here. So you see it go negative here, and you see it start to charge, and now it's still charging. It's taking so long for this thing to charge up to uh, the value uh, that it was before. And so you can see that when you change the reference point, on the capacitor like that, um, you end up going from a, a positive voltage on one side of it um, to uh, uh, all of a sudden this drop in voltage to the other side because just because you've changed the reference point. And that was something that was kind of interesting and new to me. And so I kind of had to build this just to prove to myself that that is exactly what's happening. So if you're asking yourself what kind of uses this circuit has, um, here I have a nine volt battery and I took that circuit and stuck it on just a small circuit board, just on uh, kind of the head of actually a 9 volt battery adapter. Uh, you can take and hook this up and if you have LEDs on the end of this um, you could attach this to your shoulder while running, you could attach this to the back of a bike and just have an LED source that's blinking just off of a real simple 9 volt battery. Uh, this is infrared LEDs but you can see if you take a look and I'll zoom in here a little bit. If you look closely you can see these LEDs actually blinking back at you even though um, they're infrared just because this is a digital camera and it can see them. 
The main thing to know is that you don't have to have a triple five timer, you don't have to have an oscillator or some kind of specialized C uh, to make a circuit and uh, make some sort of a timing a stable multivibrator circuit. I've seen this done in this fashion, I've seen this done with NAND gates, I've seen this done with a bunch of other ways as well. As always for the schematics and parts list, I've got all that information down in the description. Also to a link uh, to the website where you can grab all that information. If you have any questions or any comments, please leave them down below. And if you have any ideas for any videos, let me know. But uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.